Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Teresa Silo, and I am uh, very happy to be introducing to you Dr. Alan Fogel for an interview for a course in the PhD program in the somatic emphasis at California Institute of Integral Studies on the further reaches of somatic psychology. So um, I met Alan Fogel many, many years ago, first time while I was uh, teaching at JFK University. And I've been following your work, Alan, ever since. And so I'm really excited and appreciative that you're taking the time to meet with me today and to sort of dialogue and answer some questions. And we are in our course, we're also spending some time on discussing some of your most recent works, the psychophysiology of self-awareness, which I think is a great contribution to the field. And before I wanna launch into some of the questions arising out of the book and out of an article that you published quite recently, I just wanna say I was always quite struck by the spectrum that you span. On one hand, you were a professor of psychology, an academic doing a lot of research on nonverbal communication and emotional development. And on the other hand, you've also been for many, many years, a, a practitioner of the Rosen Method bodywork and a trainer of that. So I was just curious if you would say a little bit, Alan, about how these two threads of your professional work have sort of cross-fertilized. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Teresa. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm glad we're seeing each other again after so many years. That's great. Um, you know, I started as an academic um, in the field of physics. Mm. And, and my goal since childhood was to become a scientist. And I thought it was going to be a physical scientist. And then I got interested in astrophysics and the universe. And, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it took me a journey. And then somehow, um, well, to make, not to make the story, story too long, but um, <clears throat> I started to go to graduate school in physics during the Vietnam War. And I didn't really want to go into the war. And so uh, I had gotten married and my wife and I chose an alternative form of service, was the, which was the Peace Corps. And we went to South America, to Bogota, Colombia. And I started teaching physics at a university actually and working on physics curricula in um, the Ministry of Education for the government. And I just really got fascinated with teaching and learning and human communication. So after our stint on the Peace Corps, I went back to graduate school in education, which turned out through the various teachers I was exposed to into a uh, career in developmental psychology. And um, somehow I got drawn to the whole process of the earliest forms of communication between parents and infants, which of course are nonverbal, which of course are emotional. And that attracted my attention and I studied that. And I, um, I did a lot of research in that domain as you probably know. <clears throat> for for many years and you know published many research articles and several books on that topic and then later in life um, I would say I was around 50 years old it was about I'm 75 now so 25 years ago whatever year that was 1998 I think something like that 97 
I um, I was feeling um, really uncomfortable in my own skin. Um, I guess you could say it was a midlife crisis, but I just didn't feel good. I felt and I and I felt like it. I had tried psychotherapy and I felt like it was more than just talking. And I was really searching for something that would reach something deeper inside of me. And it just so happened through a set of coincidences that there was somebody practicing Rosen Method body work here in Salt Lake City where I live. So I decided, oh, well, I'll call this person. And I took my very first session and I felt literally transformed, like I had been reached in a way that I had never been reached before. And I just continued taking sessions from this person. Eventually she moved out of the field, but I got so interested that I went into the practitioner training program. And, you know, it took me, it's, it's not like um, um, a PhD program or something. You you take intensives that you do two or three times a year, and then you do an internship, et cetera. So it took me about five years, and I was still a full-time academic. Um, but I finally got certified as a practitioner, and then some years later went through another training program to become a teacher of the work. But um, at first, you know, I was drawn to it because, because of the nonverbal mm. aspects of it and the emotions that it brought up. There is a verbal component to Rosen Method, but it's the kind of um, talking that deepens and widens felt experience. So it's not about what does this mean or how could I make this better? It's more about just notice what you're feeling and stay with your feeling. And, and that whole process allows the feelings to become, to arise to the surface in a way that they, you didn't know that they, you had them before, they were somewhere in your unconscious. Mm. But something about the presence of another person who is trained to just be there and support, um, Marian called, Marian Rosen called the practitioner a midwife. It was as if we're giving birth to, to something from the unconscious and bringing it into consciousness, conscious awareness through the whole body system, through felt experience. So um, <clears throat> I just got more and more taken by that. And I started a private practice and I did it part time while I was still a full-time faculty member. But it began to transform my, my research and my teaching at the university. So I actually wrote a couple of textbooks on infant development. And I developed in my classroom and in those textbooks what I called experiential exercises, which allowed, um, which were very much came from my Rosen experience which allowed students to like get on the floor and feel what it was like to be a baby, not just to think about infancy, but to actually experience it, something of that in their own bodies and to feel what attachment really feels like, um, secure and insecure attachment and things like that. So, um, you know, gradually they wove together and then I retired from, um, um, academia in 2012 mm -hmm. and became more active in teaching and doing Rosen work. So that, that kind of brings me to the present day. And of course, I, I um, wrote that book that you showed earlier, and I just finished a new book called Restorative Embodiment and Resilience, which is also based on my experience as a Rosen practitioner. But I feel that the, all of that work um, is, you know, cuts across so many fields, including somatic psychology, um, that I tried to make the writing and the books as 
as general as possible and not just confined to Rosen method. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like so many people are seeking the same truth or the same wisdom of the body. Right. And in a way, part of I feel like really what you're contributing here is not just a deeper understanding, but also developing more language around what is it that we're doing when we're engaging somatically, you know? So I really, um, I think it's an important element to move the field forward. Mm -hmm. And in that way, um, when I think about your book, The Psychophysiology of Self-Awareness, you know, the depth and detail to which you're describing interoception and proprioception and the relationship to emotions and body schema, I sort of feel I can hear your body work experience coming through your theory. And it's quite precious because that's the kind of combination that we need in order to understand more fully from a direct experience, what is it that we're talking about? So I, I appreciate the hard work that probably has gone into this book and I'm sure your next book, because it's always quite an endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking about today, oh, and, and let me just say also what you said earlier about Rosen work. What strikes me is that expression that you had. I feel like I've been reached in a way that I've never been reached before. So to me, that speaks of a level of contact, self-contact, but also regulatory contact with somebody else. That's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I wanted to focus in on, Alan, in it seems like in your new book, which I haven't seen. I think it's just coming out. Is that correct? Yes, it's um, due out at the end of September, but you can actually pre-order it on Amazon. Another Great, website. great. I feel like I got a little bit of a preview uh, through the article that you published uh, on three states of embodied self-awareness. And I was wondering, would you give us a brief synopsis of what you mean by these states? You're talking about um, the, let me just see it here, the dysregulated embodied state of awareness, the modulated embodied state of awareness, and then the most deep, deepest layer, the restorative embodied state of awareness. Can you speak a little bit about those and the distinction between those? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, and I'll try to try to condense it to a relatively brief. <laughs> because there's a whole book to write about it. <laughs> so it's interesting because in the in the psychophysiology of self-awareness, I distinguish between conceptual self-awareness and embodied self-awareness. And um, one of the things I came to, and largely because of my Rosen practice and my own experience as a Rosen client and um, just going deeper into my own embodied experience, is that I no longer feel that um, thinking is separate from embodied experience. I feel like thinking is it's generated by the body. I mean, thought comes from an embodied experience. It comes from the same cells in the nervous system and <clears throat> that extend throughout the whole body as felt experience or embodied felt experiences. And, and so in these three states, I tried to clarify what seemed to me, um, and also came out of some research that I did um, on Rosen Method um, clients and practitioners, um, kind of three different ways that we can be embodied, the restorative, the modulated, and the dysregulated. So 
Let me start with the modulated because I think that's where most of us live most of the time. Mm -hmm. We're typically in a modulated state of embodied self-awareness. And in modulated states, according to my definition, we're, most of the time we're engaged in some sort of thought process. We're solving problems, um, trying to understand ourselves. We're um, making judgments, evaluations. Um, that's all part of what's called the task positive thought network. And it's a, it's a different brain network than what's called the default mode network, which is another form of thinking, but it's more like free associative. So it's like mind wandering. It's like the kinds of things we think when we're off task. Mm -hmm. So if we're going for a walk in nature um, or even just lying down and resting without a book in front of us or a TV in front of us, usually we are in default mode thoughts. We're thinking about the things we did during the day or during the week. We're thinking about other people in our lives. We're thinking about things we should have said or should have done or could have said or could have done. <laughs> um, that's, it's called the default mode for a reason. It, just because that's where we go in terms of thinking um, when we don't have anything else to do. And it's surprising how much of a percentage of time that takes up in our lives. It's so pervasive. It's like part of the air we, it's like the air we breathe. It's there so much that we don't often even notice that we're doing it. Now, um, it's I like the, the waters we swim in. Yeah, exactly. And of course, there are two different neural networks, the task positive and the default mode, but they both connect into the body through the brain stem and spinal cord. So um, we can have an ache or a pain. We can have a brief feeling of emotion, you know, something that may come up that may make us feel irritated or make us feel sad. And you know, our thinking networks take that little bit of felt experience and we try to make something out of it. Like we try to understand it. Why am I so irritated right now? Um, what just happened? Or um, what's making me sad? And where did that come from? And who said what to me? And, you know, so we, we run through all these scenarios and explanations or if we're, you know, if we feel irritated, we, we think about, you know, maybe thoughts about, you know, that are a little bit pissy or angry or whatever. But whatever it is, the body feelings are not staying very long as actual felt experiences. They're being modulated by thought. Um, if you look at the field or the literature on emotional intelligence, what you find is that's all about how to modulate emotions with thought, about understanding emotional states, recognizing that we're in an emotional state, explaining our emotional state to others, um, being empathic verbally with another person, those are all what I would consider modulated embodied self-awareness. So that's sort of our default state. That's where we go most of the time. That's where we live most of the time. Now, there's also this dysregulated state, dysregulated embodied self-awareness. And that's kind of a perversion of modulated uh, self-awareness. So the default mode thoughts that we might be having in a modulated state, in a dysregulated state, those thoughts become what's known as ruminative. That is, 
we're blaming ourselves over and over and over again for something we said or did, or blaming somebody else in our mind. Or um, they're obsessive. They're, we can't, we're stuck in them. We can't let them go. Or they're depressive. We're saying we're not worth, we're worthless. We're not, you know, we can't do anything right. Um, you, you know, those sort of stuck thought patterns are very much part of a dysregulated state of embodied self-awareness. The same thing is true for feelings or felt experiences. In dysregulated states, they become ruminative. That is, we, um, we, we feel pain and we can't get away from it. It's like pervasive. Or we feel angry and we're totally stuck in it. We can't let it go. And we act out and we um, um, do hostile things or stay hostile things. So um, dysregulated states are kind of stuck states. Um, <clears throat> and and um, they partake primarily of the default mode network kind of thinking. Um, because if we could, if we could use emotional intelligence to say why we're stuck, then we would be in a more modulated state, right? We would be using our task positive network. Um, so we really don't have access to, you know, real problem solving or um, reasoning about the stuckness. We're just stuck. And we typically need help to get out of those states. We need a kind listener. We need um, a hand on our shoulder. We need a psychotherapist. Um, who knows what? But we need some kind of support because literally we can't solve the problems by, by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So th that's those two states. Um, they both involve feelings and they both involve thought. Um, the feelings and modulated states are brief. Like I get a glimpse of my anger, but then I'm explaining it to myself. And I'm trying to understand it. Um, in dysregulated states, they can be overpowering and overwhelming. Okay, so what's a restorative state? A restorative state is when Typically, there are, there's no thought. There's no test positive thought, and there's no default mode thought. It's primarily felt experience. And it's the kind of felt experience that brings relief rather than misery. So um, it's like, um, and this is what I found so powerful about the Rosen work, is like there's somebody with me who is touching me, who's really there with me. And I can finally, finally feel the grief about some loss or some trauma. And I can just let myself cry. And that comes with a flood of parasympathetic um, relief. You know, I take a deeper breath, the tears come, I feel softer. Um, everything about me opens up. Um, I and and somehow the pain disappears. I feel better. I feel cleansed. I feel restored, and that's what restorative is all about. And that's very different. We're bathed in the feeling, in some way similar to a dysregulated state where we're bathed in felt experience. But we're bathed in it in a way that leads to relief mm. and healing mm -hmm. and restoration. And typically, I think for both dysregulated and restorative states, we need other people um, to, to uh, either get us out of a dysregulated state or help us stay with some really uncomfortable feelings that have been haunting us long enough. Um, to make them feel restorative. Of course, we can feel um, we can feel restorative going for a walk in nature. Um, if instead of letting our default mode thoughts run, we just really 
take in the sound of the sea or the vastness of the mountains and we're we're flooded with a feeling of awe and grace um, that's restorative mm -hmm. um, so it's like the feeling whatever it is fills up our consciousness but in a way that that feels like like it it's healing and deepening mm, right and so what you're saying uh, alan of course there is nature and the power of nature that can help us to access it but in lieu of that really a skillful compassionate other yes. is an essential component for us to really to be able to drop there yeah so if you think about a, um, if you think about a baby who has no words and no explanation and no thoughts um, and is in pain is suffering is crying and then mom or dad or somebody loving picks up that baby and just holds the baby and then you start to see the baby you start to see the crying abate a little bit and you start to see breaths coming in um, and um, sobs that are broken with breath, um, more sobs that are broken with breath, and then a gradual relaxation and calming and softening that the baby just sinks into your arms. Mm. And, and there's it goes from a sense of total dysregulation to a sense of total. Um, you know, being held and, and warm and safe. And um, that's, I think that's what somatic kinds of therapies really can help us with. Mm. Um, it's not about talking through things. Right. It's about, yeah, um, the mother could be saying or the father could be saying, you're really... Um, upset right now, although they don't have to say that. Um, I'm just going to hold you, mm -hmm. and pretty soon you're going to feel better. Right. And if there's there's a knowing about that in a compassionate parent, um, there's some kind of knowing about the way the nervous system works, mm -hmm. um, which I think can inform therapy as well. Mm -hmm which is the knowing that just being present with another person fully and completely in all their pain and sorrow or all their happiness is enough. Mm, right. It's pretty um, powerful. It's very powerful because it immediately shifts us from a kind of sympathetic overloaded kind of state to a parasympathetic state of dropping in, of coming to rest, of finding peace, of finding a sense of trust and security. Mm. Yeah, great. And I am wondering if you would be willing to say a little bit, Alan, because it seems like it's quite a, a learning and a development to drop to that level of awareness. And as you mentioned, it takes a support of other, in many cases, to be able to get there. In your article, you talked about that we're able to access, in a way, um, felt experiences from the limbic system, which you described as level two, but maybe even felt experiences all the way down to the brainstem. And so I'm just, would you, uh, what's your speculation? What's our potential as far as making those usually autonomic processes conscious to become aware of it, to stay present with it? What would you think is possible as we continue to cultivate these more subtle uh, states of awareness? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's uh, 
I'm just trying to be with the um, question for a minute mm. because it, it touches on so many, so many things. So, I mean, here we are where there's live, we are living beings and we're, we're composed of cells and water, basically. And um, we're pulsing and throbbing all the time. And um, in this modulated state where we live most of the time, or in the dysregulated state where people who are really suffering are living most of the time, we are not aware of those cellular processes. We're in our heads, basically. Um, we're thinking a lot, we're, we're doing, we're um, activated, <clears throat> or we're just trying to cope, we're struggling. Um, so to really feel into the depths of our embodied experience takes us, you know, does take a kind of presence mm -hmm. and it takes us into more restorative territory. So <clears throat> in um, anything that's conscious, like any kind of felt experience that comes into awareness or consciousness and arises out of something we didn't realize we were feeling, or we could call that the unconscious. Um, <clears throat> um, any kind of awareness or consciousness is because we have a nervous system. Okay, it's, and it's, it's certain dedicated parts of the nervous system that help us to become aware of the inner condition of our body. And that includes interoception, like warmth and cold and itchiness, and, um, um, uh, air hunger, you know, when we're short of breath, or basic body sensations, um, ticklishness. Um, that's interoception, it includes proprioception, which is the feeling of movement and space and boundaries and the feeling of our size and shape. That's all proprioception. It's slightly different neural network, but they all end up in the part of the brain called the insula, which is the part of the brain that translates all these different signals that are coming from the body into, or has the possibility, I should say, of translating them into conscious awareness. A lot of times the insula is subverted and we never actually, those signals that enter the insula never make it to conscious awareness. But if we feel safe enough and supported enough, um, somehow those are the primary conditions for bringing a lot of what, what our body is experiencing into conscious awareness. Um, <clears throat> we also have autonomic feelings, that is, that's the feeling of aliveness. Um, all the things that the autonomic nervous system controls, like feeling our pulse and our heartbeat and our breath and our um, and our hormones and um, you know sexual arousal or hunger or you know thing digestion digestive feelings. Those are all autonomic feelings. Again, they come from a slightly different part of the nervous system that they're all connected into the insula. And then finally, we have emotional feelings, which, um, <clears throat> which are the way we interpret all those other kinds of feelings. It's, it's, the kind, it's sometimes called valence or value. So <clears throat> let's take the interoception of feeling warm. Okay, so on a hot day, that, interoception may translate into an emotion of um, discomfort or disgust or, you know, yeah, you know, I don't like this. That's emotion, like or dislike, approach or avoid. Or if it's a cold day and we're feeling warm, it may feel very wonderful, may make us happy, it may 
uh, make us smile. <clears throat> so our emotions are coming in and putting a kind of color or interpretation on the interoception, proprioception, and autonomic feeling. If we're feeling our heart racing um, <clears throat> and we have a history of, um, like me, heart disease, I'm going to get scared by that. I'm going to, um, that's going to push me to feeling like I'm having a heart attack and a sense of panic. Um, on the other hand, if I've been exercising and I'm feeling my heart racing and I know I've been exercising, I'm going to feel pretty good about that. You know, like, hey, my heart's working and I feel great. And, um, you know, this is um, enlivening and makes me happy. So, mm -hmm. again, you know, it's all about the context of the of all those body sensations, what the emotion is about. <clears throat> now, again, how much we're actually aware of all those sensations really depends on our sense of safety, the amount of experience and permission we've been given to really feel what's happening inside of ourselves. Um, many of us are taught in childhood to ignore our emotions, to ignore our pain. Um, if we've been abused or um, molested, we've been taught to suppress even the most wonderful feelings like sexuality. Um, we've been, um, you know, so, so, so much depends on our developmental history and our current environment about whether the feelings that are coming from our body can get through, so to speak, and become awareness, become awareness of felt experience. So if we've been traumatized, um, <clears throat> you know, certain kinds of somatic therapy really do help in helping us get past or identifying the feelings, the traumatic feelings, and coming to terms with the fact that, you know, we do have a body and that our body is still alive and that um, we can find some sense of pleasure in our body. Mm. And, um, you know, of course, with that comes a sense of relief and restoration again, we feel. We've been put back together after we've been taken apart. <clears throat> so um, I, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but that's the basic idea. That's what gets us kind of through the barrier of the unconscious into something that we can be aware of. Mm. And I, I love that you call it restorative embodied self-awareness because that in itself already speaks to what can happen with that, you know, a form of participation with our body that enhances its vitality and really its health and its yeah. potential. So yeah. it feels like it's really pointing in a very powerful direction of how we can be connected to our own embodied experience. Yeah, I sometimes tell my clients it's like <clears throat> regaining um, embodied territory that was lost or captured. Um, and we're reclaiming the parts of ourselves that were taken away or mm -hmm. robbed or stolen right. from us. And yeah. there's a sense of um, healing that comes from completeness and coming, coming into a sense of wholeness and oneness and a sense of being comfortable in our own skin with who we are and what, how we look with what we've suffered, all of that coming to a place where we can accept it and um, um, find peace with mm -hmm. what right. happened. Right. Well, this is probably a, a good place to stop, Alan, even though I know there's a lot more that could be said, but I feel like it's given, it will give our students a taste of what your work is about. And 
I want to thank you again for taking the time and yeah, and for engaging in that dialogue. You're so, so welcome. Uh, thank yeah. you. And I'm okay. going to stop the recording now. Okay.